Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Learning from the Pointillists, Using Big Data Approaches to Embrace the Complexity of Cancer. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Ken Buto has 30 plus years experience as a data scientist. Formerly trained as a geneticist and genomicist, he develops and applies IT infrastructure and analytic approaches to collect, manage, manipulate, and interrogate large complex biomedical data sets. As part of the Human Genome Project, his group undertook pioneering uses of the internet in biomedicine to create the Human Inheritance Map. Later, while leading the National Cancer Institute's efforts in biomedical informatics, he launched efforts to connect the global cancer community. He is leading ASU's next generation cyber infrastructure effort, creating a 21st century multi-capability data science research instrument designed to leverage computational, storage, software, and human capital to complex problems in biomedicine. Ken received his BA from Indiana University and an MS and PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you very much, Judy, for the, for the introduction. And uh, I wanna thank the audience for uh, joining this session. Um, uh, I look forward to uh, spending the time together and, uh, and uh, uh, sharing with you uh, interesting work that we're doing in my group uh, in applying big data approaches uh, to helping us understand uh, and embrace the complexity of cancer. As this group is more than aware, uh, we're in the midst of a transformation of the whole biomedical enterprise. That transformation uh, is uh, in the form of personalized medicine. Personalized medicine being targeting the right, getting medicines to the right individual, delivering the right care at the right time in the right place. This personalized medicine uh, uh, transformation is at once revolution. Uh, it, it embraces the very molecular nature of an individual and their disease, but it's also renaissance. It returns us back to uh, a, a previous time uh, when physicians and care delivery individuals knew not only the characteristics of, one dis of one's disease, but also knew the characteristics of the person themselves, their preferences, uh, what were the challenges in their life, uh, as well as the, the environment in which they worked in, uh, lived in, and the environment that may dictate or change how their care may be received or their care may be able to be uh, delivered. As this audience is more than aware, we're now more than 10 years into this uh, personalized medicine revolution uh, shown on this slide is the, is the, uh, uh, is the breakthrough uh, poster child, uh, literally the cover story of personalized medicine, Gleevec, that at the time was heralded as a, a tremendous revolution in how cancer was going to be treated, where drugs were driven by the to specific individual characteristics of the disease uh, and had tremendous success uh, when applied. What we've learned though over time and even in the earliest of trials is that these wonder drugs, while miraculous, uh, literally watching tumors melt away in a subset of individuals, had other challenges and continue to have challenges associated with them. For instance, we could see that, uh, that even the best of the drugs uh, did not work in all individuals. And we could see that some individuals uh, had almost immediate failures. 
we also saw that even uh, those that did appear to have responses, uh, shortly uh, and durable responses for, as we can see here, measured in weeks, ultimately uh, had their tumors come back and sometimes respond almost at catastrophic rates. The, suddenly, instead of failing gently, uh, the tumors would actually return with a vengeance. Uh, so while unequivocally there's an immediate impact that occurs from treating uh, individual uh, individual molecular lesions uh, with these marvelous new drugs, uh, there's clearly something more going on, something more going on as to why some folks don't respond, why even after folks respond, uh, there continues to be uh, uh, ongoing failure and ongoing and ultimately complete failure of this new intervention and the interventions only lasting commonly for a matter of single digit months at best. So what is going on? Well, I think the key thing to embrace is that cancer, uh, as much as we would hope that it could be due to perhaps a single molecular modification, is in fact complicated. So what do I mean by complicated? Well, as this group knows, cancer starts from origin or originates in otherwise normal cells. Those normal cells over time accumulate multiple mutations forming in some instances, uh, for all intents and purposes, a new organ within an organ. Those multiple mutations actually occur, not just a handful of them, but there are actually dozens to hundreds to, in some individuals, thousands of mutations. Uh, uh, not at all uncommon for there to be a uh, hundred different mutations observed in any given uh, cancer that's analyzed at a molecular level. And more challenging and pragmatic is that those hundreds of mutations are not shared between two different individuals. So this mutational profile occurs is relatively novel for each individual who develops cancer. Over and above this mutational profile, clearly we can have changes that occur at the DNA level, specific mutations that we can catalog, but alterations can occur at a level other than specific changes to, nu to a nucleic acid or a DNA molecule. They can occur by changes in copy number, uh, they can occur by changes that change the expression of a gene while not changing the coding sequence of the gene itself. They can occur through epigenetic mo modifications, changes that don't alter the nucleic acids at all, but instead change the coding, change the regulatory framework uh, by which genes are expressed and genes are, uh, uh, and genes manifest their products. Uh, they can occur uh, through the newly uh, exciting field of microRNAs, other RNA class molecules that modify the, the behavior of otherwise normal or uh, the rest of the protein uh, coding genome. And lastly, there's modifications that can occur in cancer cells over and above uh, the specifics uh, related to the proteome. They can occur through other biochemical uh, methods and processes. We also know that cancer requires multiple changes in fundamental processes to manifest. Uh, shown on this slide, as we can see, those key processes such as growth factor independence, evading apoptosis, telomere maintenance, cell cycle regulation, and angiogenesis. Uh, so for more than a decade, uh, the seminal paper by Hanahan and Weinberg clearly indicated that cancer required a cell to evade a whole variety of control mechanisms. But what's emerged in the decades since this was postulated was the recognition that these are not single gene phenomena, but in fact are products of complex networks. Uh, that growth factor independence or telomere maintenance actually requires a whole collection of interacting genes in order for one to uh, be able to manifest cancer. Moreover, what's been observed is as we look at each of these individual processes, we can see that one individual's mutation may target one of the genes in a different process, 
in one of these processes. But if we look at another individual, it's a different set of genes that are mutated. And yet another individual would have another collection of genes that are modified. So all this is occurring just simply at the somatic level for cancer. Over and above the somatic level of cancer, we also have our genetic constitution, the inherited variation ranging anywhere. Each of us has one to five million differences in the DNA that we inherited from our mother versus the DNA we inherited from our father. And it's been well demonstrated that that genetic constitution can change the processes of angiogenesis, uh, the basic fundamentals of your cellular matrix or your immune response, or also importantly, can modify, filter, change, or eliminate the effects of chemicals, viruses, hormones, nutrition, a whole series of exogenous factors. So to be fair, cancer, it's not only complicated, it's very complicated. And the point I'm trying to make is that we ignore this complexity at our peril. And almost assuredly, we now know that it is that complexity that drives the, the differences in responses and the refractory nature of individuals who are developing cancer, uh, who are failing or ultimately developing resistance to their treatments. Uh, this complexity is now being further embraced, ironically, from the folks that initially had hoped and were positing uh, the reductionist paradigm that cancer could or, or might be simple, that if we just simply understood or knew uh, the handfuls of mutations that would occur, uh, that, that we would be able to overcome cancer. So even the uh, pillars of uh, this simplicity paradigm, folks like Weinberg, who had suggested the original basic simple set of processes are now indicating that if we're going to make progress in cancer, we're going to have to figure out how to embrace this true underlying complexity. So I would actually argue that the way we embrace this complexity is in part to take a page from the pointillists. Uh, our current point of view is that if we just focus sharply enough and deeply enough on any given set of points or a specific set of points that will understand cancer. What the pointless realized is that in fact, to truly get a rich, colorful tapestry, what we needed to do was interconnect and combine points. Uh, and that by combining individual points, there would be emergent properties, novel colors, novel perceptions that would make a painting rich, understandable, and convey a message. This is exactly what nature is doing uh, as it is creating the complex fabric that is our biologic framework, but also what is being disrupted in cancer. So what we recognize is if we actually embrace this complexity, look at the emergent properties, we can see that those points actually do have a coherence that as we start to assemble them more and more, present a picture. And as that picture starts to emerge, we can actually see the broader story. And through that story then, can better understand how cancer manifests, and more importantly, hopefully, how to intervene uh, to, change it, uh, to change its course. So cancer, uh, to be more technical, is a complex adaptive system. So what do I mean by a complex adaptive system? Well, it evolves over time, as we just showed in the previous set of cartoons. It has adaptive behavior. So cancer today isn't the same as cancer was yesterday. And more pragmatically, it changes in response to the environmental factors uh, that, it's, that it's confronting. Uh, those environmental factors may be its cellular milieu, but it may also be the interventions that we are taking against it. Uh, it has a very large no number of, elephant, or, uh, of elements. Uh, element, <laughs> elephants may be the correct Freudian slip here, an elephant collection of elements that defy conventional descriptions. And in fact, it's not only impractical, but it's not clear that we can use simple mathematical descriptions of how the system would work. The past 
is co-responsible for the present. So where you were makes a difference as to where you're going. But I guess I would say most importantly among the core complex adaptive system properties is it has emergent properties. In other words, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. So if there's a key take home lesson is the recognition that we can't completely understand cancer simply by taking it apart and looking at it at a piece at a time. It, there are properties that emerge by the combination of particular facts and components. Uh, key to understanding how a complex adaptive system works is it's critically dependent, the pieces of a system are dependent on resources, and most importantly, on information uh, and the transfer of information within the system, which brings us then to the recognition that cancer is information laden and a big data problem. To understand how the system is working, we have to know that information and the information flows between the individual components. Well, big data, What what is big data? Perhaps one of the uh, most commonly used word. I don't think you can open a newspaper today without somebody talking about the power and the revelations uh, that emerge from big data uh, and what folks are doing with big data. Well, big data definitionally is um, big. Uh, it's large volume. And in particular, when we're in the personalized medicine criteria, uh, we re actually recognize if we're doing genome sequencing or evaluation of the whole molecular profile, we're looking at three times 10 to the ninth base pairs. We're looking at a big volume of data. But it's also clear that big data, especially meaningful use of big data, not only embraces the volume of the data, but it also embraces the variety of the data as well as the velocity, and that's the interconnection and changes in data over time. So for us to truly embrace cancer as a big data problem, we need to manage large volumes, understand its diversity, and figure out how it changes and sometimes rapidly changes over time. So clearly, the genome is one source of the big data in, in the cancer problem, but over and above the genome definition, the molecular definition, we also know that there are rich collections of data from the phenome. And when I say phenome in this instance, I mean the clinical characteristics, personal characteristics uh, that describe who an individual is and what they have experienced over and above their uh, inherited and or acquired genome. And over and above that, there's the exposome that's important. This is the vast array of, of of environmental inputs, the components that are all around us that set the context for what defines your phenome and for what your genome is reacting to. The phenome data comes from many, many different places. There's a diverse types of phenome data, the clinical observations, laboratories, imaging, registry, biospecimens, and even reference data, and it's distributed in many, many different sources. So one of the challenges of doing big data in biomedicine is embracing its large collection of sources and distributed places of both its large collection of sources and large collections of types. Uh, one of the key pieces of emerging big data that in many ways will rival uh, the size of the data associated with genomes is imaging data. Uh, as we get more and more sophisticated in non-invasive ways of characterizing molecular state and individual constitution, uh, Imaging, uh, shown here, is just the uh, transit of a drug through an individual and seeing where it originally is reposited, where it goes, uh, and then where it ends up. Uh, these images, any one of them, are as large in terms of uh, computer storage size as a genome, but are, re are remarkably powerful in describing a phenotype. But this is just the beginning. We're, we're at the precipice of revolutionary new data resources that will be of equally large volume. Uh, earlier this year was launched or announced Google's attempt to create smart contact lenses. These are lenses that would uh, are essentially little molecular monitors that you would wear in your eye that would have the ability to 
uh, continuously monitor any number of biologic entities, uh, again, creating a large data feed that changes rapidly over time, both uh, uh, volume and velocity, uh, but also variety, because these different chips will ultimately be tuned to manage your a whole collection of dynamic variables that, again, will dwarf uh, the genome in its size. And this, but one of a whole series of examples of things that are exploding on the monitoring front. Uh, shown here are just a handful of them uh, that are on, that would actually not only monitor your physiologic state, your phenome, uh, but would also allow you to manage and, and capture information on your exposome, the environmental entities that to date has been quite commonly a black box other than well-described, well-known risk factors like cigarette smoking or some other exogenous force. These are going to allow us to have much deeper collection of information of what one's lifetime experiences are related to the environment that one lives in. So how do we take this data and convert it into evidence? Because at the end of the day, data may be large and may be useful, but it doesn't actually translate into anything that's actionable until we change it from data to information. And the key variable in changing uh, data to information is by understanding the relationship between individual data, the specific data items. So when we understand, map, or derive the relationship between data points, we start to have information. But at the end of the day, real evidence is more than just information. It's Evidence is information in context, uh, where we now understand the pattern in, and increase the connectedness. And what we're really interested in is not just even information. Information is valuable, uh, but the true actionable information is knowledge, which requires us to further connect and understand the pattern of data, as well as its relationship to other data points. So what I want to spend a few minutes for is talking a little bit about what we're currently doing uh, in my lab and others uh, in addressing this large scale data class opportunities and challenges and how we're going about trying to convert data into information and information into knowledge. What I want to start with is approaches that are being taken to discover the relationships, the first step from starting with big data and converting it into information. So uh, to borrow a page from the graduate and uh, what young Benjamin was counseled, uh, when people say, where should I look, you know, what should I look and what should I be worrying about? If we want to know who's on the leading, bleeding edge of doing novel work in discovering relationships, I would point you simply to Google. So most of us are familiar and are almost addicted to Google. I can't, it's at times difficult for me to picture how I used to do either my personal or professional life before I had ready access to Google to answer all my questions. But one of the ways that Google is able to be such a powerful entity in providing critical information is that it constantly is building the relationships between, informa between data to create information. I'm sure everyone has, I, has at some point in time uh, in doing a search marveled a bit at what they call anticipatory search, uh, where as you start to type in a particular set of words, Google starts to anticipate what kind of search you may want to be doing. That comes uh, from them understanding the connections uh, and the relationships between different pieces of data so that they can use that in meaningful ways. Uh, as you might guess, the metaphor as we then move into uh, biomedicine, genetics, genomics, and cancer, what we want to be doing is doing with uh, biomedical data the same sort of understanding of relationships of all those individual pointillistic points the same way that Google does with the data that's present in its large query database. Another example of this uh, in a different set of analytics and different set of approaches is what Amazon does. Uh, I'm sure all of us have had the experience when we've decided to purchase an Amazon book suddenly being uh, brought to our attention. 
uh, a series of additional books that we might be interested in that, to be honest with you, quite commonly do find things that would be of interest. And again, this is leveraging analytics that look at the, uh, that discover the relationship between large collections of disconnected points. Uh, what they do is uh, look for non-obvious relationship analysis through doing a process called non-obvious relationship analysis, look for and find uh, non-random patterns that uh, are useful for making predictions uh, and that are useful in driving uh, what sort of actions you might take or facilitating the actions that you might want to take. All of this is actually part of an, an emerging new field, uh, the fourth paradigm science, uh, which stands on the shoulders of, of, of previous paradigms, the previous three that started with observational, built into experimental, and then drove to uh, manipulative uh, data science uh, or paradigms of science. What fourth paradigm science does is complement data generating science with data driven science. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, in the traditional definition of fourth paradigm science, they would say hypothesis testing science uh, as opposed to data driven science. Actually, I, uh, I refuse to acknowledge that data driven science doesn't test hypothesis. Uh, partially, I guess I would posit that given the number of fields that have been doing data-driven science uh, actually for not only decades, uh, in some sense, centuries. Uh, if we look at astronomy, physics, economics, climate, and, and now, hopefully, genomics. Uh, but the reason I would actually argue that data-driven science can also be hypothesis testing science is I, I would posit that we don't talk about Newton's uh, good ideas of planetary motion. We talk about Newton's laws of planetary motion. And to the best of my knowledge, there has not yet been a successful experiment where one has actually moved or realigned a planet to test what would actually happen if you moved a planet. Uh, what is done instead is pre-constructing hypothesis that then can be tested with the, with the additional sets of observations or additional sets of data examinations or collections that allow one to ask and answer questions in a completely data-driven space without actually formally manipulating the system per se. Uh, but again, data-driven science can and I think will be is perceived to be as rigorous in the future uh, as the previous three paradigms of science. Part of this is driven by the unreasonable effectiveness of data. This is a paper that has driven much of the internet commerce universe uh, over the last decade uh, by the recognition that large volumes of data have inherently captured in them information and knowledge that can be actually actionable and that if we harvest that information uh, uh, we can actually do interesting and important things. Uh, as this group is probably aware there's a whole multi-billion dollar interest street now tied around the harvesting of data converting it to information and trying to harness knowledge. Uh, if, for instance it was just announced yesterday that uh, uh, that uh, Facebook now announced its uh, third quarter uh, profit statements and uh, has made more than a billion dollars in advertising from directing uh, or capturing and translating the data it collects into information that it uses to drive people uh, to particular, uh, particular purchases or to particular ads. All of this work to date is really all around uh, the what was a question posed uh, uh, almost a, almost a century ago, almost a century and a half ago, uh, by uh, by John Wanamaker, one of the uh, famous moguls of of commerce uh, at the time, uh, a pioneer in uh, merchandising and in sales, uh, and the question that he framed was the, that he spends half the money he spends on advertising is a waste and he doesn't, couldn't figure out which half. And so what the new data entrepreneurs are doing in advertising uh, is figuring out who should get what advertising and targeting that advertising to those individuals. 
uh, I might suggest that this is completely isomorphic with the personalized medicine agenda. It's actually taking information that we would know about individuals uh, and then directing it and then directing our interventions to uh, those individuals, just the same as the ads are doing. Uh, as I indicated, there's a multi-billion dollar industry doing this to date. And, and uh, one of the pioneers of that, Jeff Hammerbacher, uh, who was one of the first individuals at Facebook that was charged with figuring out why there was adoption at certain places and now that's transformed into advertising, uh, indicated that, that what we're doing is, is again, driven by a, a mercantilistic point of view. We we're clearly are leveraging that framework, but unfortunately, most of the bright minds addressing these problems to date are more around how do we get people to click on ads than how do we get people to respond to next generation uh, therapeutic interventions. That said, uh, uh, young, uh, young Mr. Hammerbacher has voted with his feet and has now left uh, Facebook uh, and, uh, and the other big data company that he helped co-found, Cloudera, which is, uh, provides the commercially supported uh, big data frameworks uh, that we and other groups are using, uh, has now moved and is challenging his talents, is channeling his talents to solving important problems at health as a, an assistant professor in genetics and genomics at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. So, uh, Jeff and others are then leading a transformation as to how do we bring this data science point of view, uh, this large scale big data point of view uh, into the healthcare arena. Uh, and are also driving uh, what we hope to be uh, <laughs> an attraction to uh, the next generation of young scientists to recognize that data scientists at least if we believe uh, what's written in the Harvard Business Review, is the sexiest job of the 21st century. So those young people who uh, might be participating in this call, I'd, I challenge you that if you're looking for some high impact, sexy new job, uh, I can only get, give you two words, data scientist. So we at ASU are also uh, uh, voting with our feet. So our intention uh, is to try to harness this uh, tsunami of data that's starting to emerge uh, both in a molecular and clinical setting and figure out a way to process this uh, and convert this data into information and information into knowledge. And we're doing this through the creation of a, of a, of a first generation data science research platform or research instrument uh, in our parlance called a next generation cyber capability or the NGCC. So what is this NGCC data science research platform? Well, basically, I think it's what we're attempting to do is do for data science uh, what the Hubble telescope uh, has done for astronomy, give a common large scale platform that uh, will facilitate doing things that one just simply couldn't do by themselves without the use of important instruments or the Large Hedron Collider in physics or the Mars Rover for the planetary exploration community. Having an instrument that would allow us to uh, capture and manipulate uh, data in unprecedented ways. Our NGCC data science instrument actually is a novel computational platform that brings together a unique collection of physical capacity ultra high bandwidth networks, 100 gigabit ethernet, which essentially means that uh, your data arrives instantaneously regardless of where it might sit in your computer or nationally or internationally. It has large scale storage. We have more than two petabytes of, uh, of storage. Uh, we have multiple flavors of computation. So we have uh, traditional high performance computing more than a thousand uh, high performance computing nodes, uh, more than 4,000 GPU based uh, processors. We have a large shared memory framework, as well as the new physical configurations necessary to support the big data framework uh, that underpins Google or that underpins Facebook or underpins Twitter, uh, the, the Hadoop large scale big data framework. 
uh, of physical constraint, of uh, physical capabilities, as well as then the logical software necessary to support that. Over and above those logical capabilities and applications that then run in this framework, we also very actively manage the data about data, metadata, data that allows us to know what data we have, as well as to, to every time we derive or, or obtain a relationship between data types to store that so that our web of knowledge, our interconnections between the data gets richer and richer every time we perform an analysis. And of course, even though this is a data science instrument, an elemental piece of this, a piece that can't literally be separated away, it's more than just hardware and software, it's people. So to be able to execute this framework, we need a whole collection of people that know how to uh, use both the physical infrastructure, know how to configure it, manage it, and interconnect it, as well as that know how to do the, the new data science analytics, the uh, new machine learning approaches, uh, and the new collections of analytic techniques that, were being applied, that are being applied in the other sectors of the economy, but are still somewhat uh, underdeveloped in the biomedical sphere. So shown here is all of the pieces coming together, save the humans, where we see the physical pieces connected to the logical pieces uh, that have managed contacts, that perform the analysis, that let us do transactions and manipulations. Uh, and then you can also see on the very, uh, very right-hand side of the figure, you can see that the intention of this is to fill this with a very large collection of various forms of data, case report form, instruments, electronic health records, molecular data, and all sorts of data that we will then, on, in an ongoing manner, mine for relationships so that we can create data, transform data into information, and hopefully provide context so that we can generate knowledge. Our early efforts at ASU are turning uh, this uh, data research instrument toward a growing worldwide problem, the problem of diabetes. And just perchance, uh, those of you who are, uh, are uh, spelling jihadists on it, this is actually is not a typo. It's meant to be combining uh, the emerging trends of obesity and diabetes, uh, which is a, a new epidemic that's, a, a epidemic that's occurring, not just in the developed world, as we might speculate, but also in the developing world. So for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, there's an explosion of obesity and diabetes worldwide. Shown on this slide is uh, highlights partially what one might expect. You can see uh, in the dark purple the places that uh, are not surprisingly high, are not necessarily surprisingly high in the rate of obesity and diabetes, North America, uh, Western Europe, uh, but what I think is interesting on this slide and that's emerging in worldwide trends is the observation that this explosion isn't only happening in the developed world, but it's also happening in the, develop, in the developing world. So I point you to India, uh, which also has an exploding collection of obesity and diabetes. Uh, not as evident on this particular figure, but if we look in the industrial, the urban areas of China, Shanghai, Beijing, other areas such as that, we can also see explosions uh, uh, and near epidemic levels of diabetes and obesity. So shortly, this is going to be a worldwide epidemic. So what we know as a community, uh, this, this is not new knowledge, is that obesity drives one to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, liver disease, and it's been known among epidemiologists for a long time that obesity also drives cancer, but this has been, uh, but this, uh, but relatively still underappreciated with the cancer community. Now, why do we get so many outcomes from obesity? Well, shown on this, I will acknowledgeably unreadable slide is a is a is a map that shows all of the factors that drive both the development of obesity 
as well as the outcomes associated with obesity. Now, in the very center of this figure would be components that most of you are, are already familiar with. We quite commonly talk about that obesity is simply a product of calories in versus calorie out. But what one understands is that the, there are many, many factors that influence that very simple equation that obesity is simply calories in, calories out, and many, many factors then that drive whether in fact one develops disease and it is still almost completely unknown as to who will develop what diseases. So shown in this next slide is the complex collection of interacting components that drive obesity and its related outcomes. So who the origins as well as the outcomes of obesity are driven by physiology, uh, by psychology, uh, by uh, physical activity, uh, by the economy, by the built environment. All of these pieces are important contributors and are pieces of the puzzle that we need to better understand. So as I mentioned, it's been well known that obesity is a contributor to, uh, to cancer risk. Um, but this has been recently been reinforced by a, a, a new study that was published a, a couple months ago in The Lancet uh, that showed that body mass index increases the risk of, of a large number of cancers. Shown on this slide are, are the top five uh, or six cancers that, uh, or excuse me, the top five cancers uh, that have the greatest impact, uh, the, which obesity has the greatest impact in altering risk. What I want to focus us on one of the members of this list, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. And what you'll hear me posit here is that are we at risk of having liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC, become the lung cancer of the current and future generations? Uh, much the same as smoking drove lung cancer uh, rates for the previous generation, uh, starting approximately at the, with the onset of large scale smoking uh, during the advent of World War II. Are we seeing that in fact liver cancer may be similarly associated with obesity uh, and will we have similar epidemics in the future as we move forward. So why do I focus on this or why might I make such a dire or cautionary prediction? One is that liver cancer, HCC, is one of only two cancers that has been consistently increasing in incidence over the last four decades. Uh, the other Cancer, well, most other cancers have either remained stable or reduced in incidence. Liver cancer and pancreatic cancer, both cancers associated with fat and obesity, have shown increases. And shown here is that over the last 40 years, the rate of liver cancer has almost doubled. Uh, and it's an equal opportunity cancer risk factor. All groups. Uh, all racial groups, all ethnic groups are showing a similar sort of doubling in the incidence of liver cancer. What's remarkable that's changing, or one of the factors that's changing is those of us with textbook knowledge of liver cancer say, well, it's all attributable to hepatitis, to the infection of hepatitis viruses, both C and B, and alcoholism, which clearly hepatitis viruses still have remarkably high odds ratios. But uh, in current uh, Western countries and in the United States in specific, we can see that actually what's the major cause of liver cancer in the United States now is diabetes and obesity. So diabetes now are the major causes of liver cancer in the United States, a re remarkable shift uh, in the exposures, the exposome components driving the particular disease. So why is this the case? Well, just very briefly, uh, we as evolutionary organisms were not well designed to live in a fat-rich, calorie-rich environment. Uh, given that the liver is a place where uh, the major metabolisms occur, uh, uh, where an energy and all sorts of metabolism processes take place, uh, evolutionarily we're designed to uh, differentially store 
fat in our liver because it's the best and easiest place for it to be mobilized when necessary. So when one actually develops uh, obesity, one's liver accumulates large collections of fat. And that fat actually, as you can see in a picture here, uh, not only disrupts uh, the basic uh, configuration, but actually interferes with the fundamental functioning of the liver, which then starts a whole process of um, auto attack against one's liver uh, that generates hepatitis, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and in some individuals, uh, ultimately liver cancer. So we've been interested in trying to start to get our arms around uh, understanding uh, what's driving this process and have been started our efforts uh, in diabetes in looking at inherited DNA variation, partially because it's the key invariant piece uh, that we can track over an individual's lifetime and have been attempting to understand both the origins of the morbidities associated with obesity, but in particular, the origins of liver cancer and see if we can predict who is likely to develop liver cancer uh, given uh, the, uh, the appropriate exposures. So our approach to doing this has been by mapping phenotype to underlying biologic process. Now, historically, there's been a variety of ways that this has been done through transmission maps, a work I did actually very early in my career through family studies. We'd look at an inheritance of risk. Uh, more recently, there's been much interest in somatic-based gene signatures. It's driven much of what we see in the uh, cancer genome atlas class projects. But what's also emerging as an important metaphor is network interaction signatures. So as I mentioned at the onset of the talk in talking about cancer's complexity, what we recognize is cancer arises through multiple mutations and alterations distributed among a whole collections of genes that, under, that are, are occurring in a variety of biologic processes. So we've been looking at how do we use network interaction signatures in order to find underlying molecular bases uh, that describe phenotypes. So we've been doing network analysis of constitutional variation. Our focus has been using novel big data tools derived by uh, my colleague, Rosemary Braun, when she worked with me when I was at the National Cancer Institute, uh, that allows us to use uh, the biologic networks, or if you're a big data scientist, you would say doing graph analysis. That's one of the ways that Facebook and Google create those complex queries, or the way Amazon knows what products you would want to do. It sort of creates the graphs of interactions that drive and help explain how people act. We're trying to do the same thing, both deriving and leveraging those graphs, those biologic networks, in understanding specific phenotypes. So we did uh, an early study, looked at liver cancer in almost a thousand individuals, but more importantly, again, in a big data context, looked at more than two million variants that were identified across those almost thousand, or, or, almost or, or over a thousand individuals. In this, what we saw was not surprisingly individual points, the pointillistic points of view, uh, interestingly, when we say significant genes, these genes were, were shown to be marginally significant, not unlike what we would see in a traditional GWAS study. But when we look now at the graphs, the biologic networks of which these genes are members of, what we could see is we would get whoppingly significant, just astronomically uh, significant uh, collections of networks, graphs, that seem to be distinguishing individuals who were destined to go on to develop cirrhosis and liver cancer uh, and discriminate those, and discriminating it from those who did not. Uh, shown here is just a, a technical graph for those who are interested in the underlying statistics of, of how this a pathway of distinction analysis shows how uh, we could see differences between the individuals who went on to develop liver cancer uh, versus individuals who uh, did not have liver cancer. So we're now applying this type of analysis not only to liver cancer, but the precursor phenotypes, as well as using these types of analysis across what is literally hundreds of terabytes. It's estimated at its completion that there'll be more than 2.5 
petabytes of data associated, for instance, with the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. We're now using these types of big data graph analysis approaches to try to find important signals uh, that were previously unidentified or were of such small effect that they were, diff they were difficult to act on. So the other area that we've been exploring is how do we not only find these relationships and leverage them, but then understand the patterns. And there's a variety of ways that we can understand the patterns. Uh, and in particular, as I mentioned, in a complex adaptive system, these patterns change over time. So uh, our strategy is to capture component understanding, known relationships either from the literature or uh, derive relationships similar to what I just described for liver cancer uh, and uh, or from our data science approaches and then join these at the interface uh, and either approach them through a combination of uh, differential equations uh, combined with uh, biomedical simulations where we actually take this information and now look for the emergent properties as we combine the reductionist components to see if the pieces behave in combination the way that they would be predicted to behave by themselves. So this is done through simulation techniques. Shown here is actually an open source public simulation tool. I realize the, the URL, the crediting URL is on the next uh, version of the slide. Uh, but what we can do is by in placing in simple rules, we can, in this instance, look at cancer developed. This is a cancer simulation from colleagues at Northwestern University, uh, where my colleague uh, Rosemary Braun is now. And what they do in this is just take simple patterns, uh, these simple observations, and watch, in this instance, a tumor develop over time. And as you can see on this progressive collection of diagrams as it not only grows, but metastasized. So the little red blob uh, that one can see on the uh, right side of the diagram here uh, is the metastatic lesion that's grown out of the original primary lesion. But what's fun, important, and illustrative about doing these simulations is that we can then manipulate specific variables within the collection of facts that we have and see what would be the influence. So in this overly simplified example, we show what would happen if you actually had some sort of intervention that would have the capacity to kill off these transitionary cells, the cells that were in place as the cell, as the tumor metastasized. And what we can see is the act of killing those, unless one was completely effective, uh, is insufficient and you still get a metastatic lesion. Similarly, we could look at what's the effect if we actually kill the moving stem cell as opposed to the transitionary cells. And we can see, interestingly and importantly, we get rid of the metastatic lesion, which may be important in cancer uh, because normally it's metastasis uh, that kill one in cancer. But you can see that it has no effect on the original tumor and given our models of heterogeneity may only be a matter of time. All of what we're seeing with our current targeted therapies before a new collection of uh, cells or migratory stem cells have the capacity to develop. Lastly, what we can see is what would happen if we kill off the originating stem cells. And what we can see is we would then be able to kill the progenitor cells in a tumor uh, but may not have any impact on a metastatic lesion. So all of these allow us to do in, uh, in silico experiments that allow us to explore different intervention strategies or different assumptions in the model. So this is meant to be cartoonishly simple. What our group is doing is, again, using our NGCC platform uh, that has uh, these uh, thousands of GPUs, game uh, processing units, were essentially creating simulations, uh, video game class uh, uh, scenarios where we can put in and change the underlying molecular rules, see how cancer behaves, and how work progresses. Shown here is work done by one of my colleagues working on these simulations. It showed by creating simple sets of rules, we could, uh, and this is an immune simulation, we could by creating particular classes of immune cells, we could successfully generate uh, and maintain 
uh, the thymus gland and chart how immune responses would be dictated through uh, this framework. So we're currently doing this uh, with a variety of different cancers, uh, trying to capture their basic sets of rules in computable form, and then perform these in silico experiments to evaluate the internal consistency of the data, uh, as well as to evaluate uh, how well and to target how we might create novel intervention strategies or better understand how either existing interventions are working or not working. So uh, in summary, I guess I want to close by uh, emphasizing that we are at this exciting new pre precipice of personalized medicine. In fact, early, uh, early efforts are underway and having success. Uh, but what we actually recognize and what's emerging uh, is that in personalized medicine, uh, we need to measure both molecular state and diverse clinical information for it to truly have an impact. Uh, personalized medicine uh, and cancer in specific is a big data problem that we can get novel insights by managing complexity through modular models and that we can find these both modular models uh, and relationships and connections through uh, an ongoing use of emerging data science tools, many of which are developing outside of biomedicine. And we believe we have early evidence that through the application of these data science approaches that we can get novel findings uh, that are even existing in large scale data sets that may have already been published and left uh, and find new and important insights by examining those. So uh, with that said, I'd like to thank you all and now move into the question and answer portion of our talk. Uh, and certainly invite, uh, I put up on the last screen here, uh, my email address. Uh, we're interested in working with and collaborating with any groups that are interested in diving into the data science waters to exploring cancer and other complex disease. Uh, but what I would do is actually open the floor to questions um, and, and, and invite the audience if you have uh, questions to please submit them in the Q&A box. Uh, and I will then uh, answer them in turn as they come about. So uh, please feel free to uh, submit questions uh, if you have them, uh, and uh, I will take them in time. So I'll start with uh, I'll start with a question that's coming. How can cancer data be collected and stored safely uh, in a developing country? Uh, I think an, an excellent and important question. And I my point of view is that. The, one of the powerful components of, of, of these new data platforms is that they work quite commonly on devices uh, that are already uh, present in uh, many developing, uh, developing countries, smart, smartphone platforms, uh, personal computing platforms. And part of our efforts, we're actually already collaborating with colleagues, for instance, in India uh, to deploy relatively simple tools that certainly allow us to collect the clinical information uh, and to partner with cutting edge institutions that have the capacity to generate the, the new generation molecular characterizations. But thank you. Uh, very interesting and important question. Um, are there other questions uh, that I might be able to ask or, or that others want to ask or answer or would like to have answered? I've got a couple minutes left yet. Um, any other questions that the uh, audience would uh, like to submit? Um, the URL, I was asked, what is the URL for the model growth tumor? Uh, let me go back and I will tell you again. I'll put it up on the screen as well as read it to you all. So the URL is... Um, is CCL or HTTP or HTTP colon slash slash CCL dot Northwestern dot EDU slash net logo slash models slash run dot CGI question mark tumor 
with a capital T, dot seven five seven dot four. Uh, and again, you all will have access to these slides. Uh, you can actually, if you didn't get it by me reading it, uh, you should be able to get it from the slides. Uh, and to be honest, if you go, if you get to just the ccl.northwestern.edu slash net logo website, uh, you'll be able to see the whole library of models that have been generated using these simple agent systems uh, to support uh, the uh, to support the generation of uh, particular models. Let me see if there's other questions. Um, so uh, I have a question as to how does one go from being a data scientist who's worked in a commercial venue to a biomedical application? Uh, I think part of what's emerging right now and certainly what we're interested in in our model at ASU is through collaboration. So we're both, number one, recruiting into our program individuals who have data science or, or those classes of backgrounds from other settings uh, to be uh, brought into our programs and be trained in biomedicine. But what we're also doing is partnering with organizations uh, that are, have expertise perhaps in fraud detection or figuring out how to drive web clicks and helping bringing, giving them access to biomedical data so that they can apply their algorithms and insights. And conversely, uh, also uh, uh, bringing their tools into our environment uh, so that they can use our research platform. So I think there's a variety of approaches. And certainly if you're, I certainly would welcome anyone who's interested in exploring these opportunities with us specifically to drop me an email. Um, Another question for clinicians and scientists who are interested in developing data science skills, can you recommend courses and textbooks? So the good news is, is there's a, a whole series of emerging open source class tools from a number of the folks that, um, um, that develop the big data tools uh, that talk about how to create, for instance, uh, I mentioned Hadoop is the, one of the prime platforms that's used that tell you how to create a Hadoop framework uh, and or run machine learning tools uh, that would allow you to do particular components. Um, some of these groups even, uh, I know one of the uh, groups that provides these platforms, for instance, MAPR, literally M-A-P-R, provides a, a downloadable piece of software that you can put on your personal computer uh, and play with to uh, manipulate these specific tools. What I would actually argue to date though, there is not many branching activities. Uh, I showed the one uh, document that the, was provided by the O'Reilly Publishing Group that talks about how big data is moving into healthcare. So I'd point you to the O'Reilly group that's publishing papers uh, and is very much involved with generating books in this. But there haven't been a lot of books and or formal papers yet. One of the niches that we're hoping to actually work with is to start creating the bridges between these communities. Okay, uh, another question, is there any possibility of an online molecular recognition of cancer caused by metabolites? The short answer is I think all of these things are on the precipice. So today there is not any such tool. But what I would argue is what we will be able to do by having creating the same sort of profile matching that's done you know, instantly on Google or Facebook or Yahoo uh, when they're doing ad matching, once we start to build and understand these relationships, we would be able to do um, uh, a whole large collection of, uh, of types of algorithms that would be smartphone class apps that I would actually argue will be transformational in our biomedical arena. Uh, another question, are there large medical data publicly available? So the short answer to that question is there are beginning to be. Um, much of the large public much of the large medical data, not surprisingly, uh, is tied up for, in some instances, human subjects concerns, uh, and for others, uh, uh, HIPAA concerns about uh, under what circumstances it could or should be shared with or without consent. Um, there, are, there are now emerging uh, 
consortium and collaborations like PocorNet's PopMedNet that would allow people to ask questions against uh, the PocorNet group will have more than 100 million lives covered under it and would allow you to get summary class information on, uh, on medical data. Uh, there's also a movement afoot from the pharmaceutical industry uh, to release data for research purposes, uh, uh, largely unrestricted for research purposes, from the comparator arms of their trials. Uh, so this is Project Datasphere. And again, these are large-scale databases that would have uh, rich, detailed, well-controlled information on uh, essentially the standard of care, which is what drives clinical trials. Okay, any other questions? All right, I'll wait a minute or so more. Uh, I would suggest that uh, just for those of you uh, who are interested, uh, the, the presentation will be online uh, if you want to go back and revisit. Uh, I'd also remind folks if they're interested in CME credits that uh, this lecture is eligible for CME credit. Uh, and those who would view the lecture online would have the ability to submit questions uh, uh, through email uh, later on, uh, asynchronously later on. So with that, I will uh, say thank you for your participation and attendance. Uh, uh, I very much enjoy the opportunity to share the, the work we're doing and the, the uh, next generation opportunities. Would welcome individuals who are interested in further conversation, further collaboration and exploration uh, to uh, join in and share in uh, and drop me a note. Uh, but with that said, I will uh, uh, say thank you and uh, uh, end this particular lecture. So thank you very much.